said it's better felt than felt. Amen. It's better to feel it and tell it about it. Isn't that right? When you feel it for yourself, just like the, the new birth now, the born again experience. I mean, when you have a born again experience, your life is turned around and you know it for a fact that Jesus forgave you of all your sins and set you free. So you just, now you want to serve God. Now you want to live for him, lift up his name for he is Lord and he's, he's He's great. There's no God like Jehovah tonight. He's wonderful. And let's just get something for our soul. How many is here? How many knows? How many wants entertained? You want to entertain? Well, I'm not an entertainer. <laughs> I'm just a just a person in the hands of God that He can anoint, and I, I can't do it without the anointing of God. The anointing was what destroys. The yoke, amen. I'm going to take a little bit of time in the Word of God tonight in the very familiar scriptures again, and just seem like all of them are familiar anymore. We preach them, and you hear them preached and taught in church and Sunday school and all this here. And, and I tell you, it don't lose its power. God's Word, it doesn't get boring. It gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Praise his holy name. Hallelujah. Man, I'm going to read a little bit about Elisha and Elijah. These two I get mixed up sometime, even Elijah and Elisha. But Elijah, he had a victorious victory over the 450 pro uh, prophets of Baal and over 400 prophets of the grove, amen, which was about 850 false prophets or people that worshiped idols and worshiped images and they thought that they'd get an answer from God. He said the God to be, he said first he said, why halt between two opinions? If God be God, we'll serve God. If Baal be God, we'll serve Baal. But he said, God that, amen, the God that will, amen, that is the true God, let him answer by fire. And we know that story, how that they whipped and beat themselves until blood flowed out of them. They, they, set, they set up and they were they're crying out to their, their idols and their gods, amen, but their God didn't hear them, didn't hear them. But they, they kept crying out to him until a certain time, and even Elijah, he made fun of them, said, well, maybe you're, you're, your God's on a journey, and he just can't hear you right now, and just poke kind of fun of them, amen, for that. But after they got done about the time of the evening sacrifice, amen, he says, now it's our, it's, our, it's our turn. He told them to rebuild the altars. They begin to put the altar back together, and they put their sacrifice upon the altar, which was pleasing to God. They put that sacrifice on the altar, and they begin, uh, amen, he says, now I want you to take and pour water on it. I believe they poured 12 barrels of water 
on, you know, on the sacrifice. See, the false prophets didn't do that because they had, sometimes they had somebody to, that would maybe uh, light, a, um, light a match. I don't know if they had matches in that day, but they would light the fire and make them think that their God is answered by fire. Amen. But it didn't happen that way. Didn't happen that way at that time. But Elijah was going to show them. He's going to make it a little bit harder. And amen, you know, the people will say, well, how can you, amen, offer a sacrifice by fire and you pour water on it like that and water soak it until the water ran down over the sacrifice and ran down into the, the uh, trench around about and filled the trench. They might have made fun too. But Elijah prayed a prayer that moved God. At that evening sacrifice, he prayed 63 words, I believe it is. Prayed 63 words. You know, it's not how long you pray. You know, some people think they can't get an answer from God unless they pray for, for hours or, or amen. But you don't have to pray that long. Just pray and trust God, but just believe what he said in his word, and he will do it. Amen. Without a shadow of a doubt. Amen. So they put the, the sacrifice there, and they, they, they uh, amen, they just prayed that prayer. And fire came down and licked up the sacrifice. Amen. That's in, I believe it's in the uh, the 18th chapter of First Kings, if you was wanting to find out where it was. But uh, we're just going to go a little bit further in that where Jezebel found out about what happened. Elijah had all those false prophets killed. And it really upset Jezebel, so she sent messengers to him and tell him, we're going to do, amen, to you what you've done unto them. And you know, it shook him up. He got all stirred up because one woman, Jezebel, was going to take his life. So he took off. Let, let's read, I believe it's in the uh, 19th chapter of, of 1 Kings, beginning at the first verse. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with a sword. And Jezebel sent messengers to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that he arose and he went for his life, and which belong, or it came to Bathsheba, and it, which belonged to Judah, and he left his servants there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He went, he been was fleeing. I don't know exactly how many miles he had ran away, but he ran f to get away from Jezebel. Amen. Sometimes people have problems just torments them day and night, day and night torments them. But God wants to bring deliverance to them. You can't run from your problems. How many know that? Jonah did that. He tried to run from God because he didn't want to go down and warn them down there, amen, about their sins and saying that was God was going to destroy the city in 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't want to do that because he didn't care too much for them people. He hated them the way that they treated the Jewish people. They were cruel to them. They killed them. They beat them. They made prisoners and slaves of them. And so Jonah did not want to do that. But anyway, he, he got on a boat going the opposite, opposite direction. Some people are doing that today. They're going in the opposite direction instead of the way that God wants them to go. Lord, don't let me go in the opposite direction because there's a work that needs to be done. People need to be blessed. People need to be healed. People need to be saved. People need to be filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. You know, we, we need a revival in this day and hour that we're living in. I mean, a revival that won't quit, a revival that will move people and set their souls on fire. 
You know, and God did that he, on the day of Pentecost. He poured it out, and then he went, amen, a few days later, he poured it out again on them. Then he went on down a few more verses and chapters in the book of Acts, found out that, that, that he poured out the, the Spirit on them again, and they were speaking in tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. Praise his name. But see, Elijah, he ran into the wilderness there, and he sat under this juniper tree. He was for, by himself. Let's just read. It said, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he, rec and he requested for himself that he might die. <laughs> he ain't going to die until the Lord says it's time. How many knew that? But there's different prophets, even... even Jonah did the same thing. He, he wanted to deny. But it wasn't his time. Man, Elijah, it wasn't Elijah's time. Elijah, when God calls a person, he, he mean, you, you're going to work for him and you're going to do what he wants you to do. And it gets rough sometimes. How many knew that? You, it gets rough sometimes of preaching the gospel and witnessing the people and tell them about the saving grace of God and trying to get them stirred up and trying to get them moving for the, with the power of God in their life. And, he, and, and I believe he just got a little bit afraid to do what God wanted him to do. You know, he'd rather for God to kill him than the Jezebel. <laughs> How many knew that? But God didn't want to do that. Matter of fact, the Bible says the angel came, and as he lay, and as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him, and said unto him, "Arise and eat." Wow, that was a miracle, wasn't it? I imagine he was probably tired and wore out from running so far, sitting under that tree. It didn't take him long. Juniper tree didn't take him long to go to sleep. But then the angel came and woke him up. He had more for him to do, didn't he? He had more for him to do. So he woke him up and said, I want you to eat this, amen, this food and drink this, uh, whatever he presented before him. And after he did that, he'd done it twice. He took and amen, in the sixth verse, said, and he looked and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and the cruise of water in his hand or it his hand and he did eat and drink and laid him down again and the second time he did the same thing so he kind of come back and done the same thing over and then he went uh 40 days 40 nights on what he had the angel boy i tell you if we can eat some angel food we can really do some fasting and praying can't we <laughs> Amen. So he, he ate, he ate the food, and the angel of the Lord said they gave him enough strength to go 40 days and 40 nights. How many knows there was other people in the Bible that, that went 40 days and 40 nights? Moses did. Moses fasted 40 days, 40 nights. Then he came down from the mountain, and he seen all the corruption and sin was going on. He broke the commandments. You know, he's the only one man in the Bible that I know of that broke all the commandments at one time. He broke the commandments, and then God sent him back up into the mountain again for another 40 days and 40 nights, and that's 80, 80 days, really, and 80 nights. Didn't say that he ate anything in between time. He went on back up into the mountains. Jesus, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And went into wilderness, and we know the story about the temptations and everything. And he overcome the devil, and the, the devils. He he lost. He got Jesus got the victory over those temptations. How did he do that? By the word of God. You know, if we're going to get victory, we're going to have to get it by the word of God. And like Jesus quoted scriptures to him. You know, the devil's not going to listen to you, Amen. If you don't quote scriptures to him. Tell him what the word says. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, one place. Then another place when he was in the wilderness being tempted, amen, he, he says, 
that man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. He said it's written. It's in scriptures in the Deuteronomy. I believe it's in the eighth chapter. It's written there. Man shall not live on bread alone. But God's got something for you to do. You're going to have to obey him. And he'll make ways for you to do it. Praise God. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be able to do it. But God makes ways for us. So anyhow, he went on the journey. He went on up further in the, in the, the mountains. As I said, I don't know how far it was when, when he, he went, but he went for quite a ways on that, what he had eaten, 40 days and 40 nights. And then the Lord got him up into the mount. The 11th verse says, and he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord and behold the Lord passed by and a great strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord but the Lord was not in the wind and after the wind the earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake you know some people think it's going to be in something in that great capacity in the wind, but God wasn't in the wind. Some people think it's the more noise you make, the more God can hear. That's not true. Man, just the more noise that you make, it don't. You can't hear nothing. You can't hear God's voice. Couldn't hear him in the earthquake. You couldn't hear him in the windstorm. But he said he heard him with a. In a still, small voice. How many knows God can speak to you in a still, small voice? In a voice that, you know, it's got to be God. You know, you can have dreams and things like that. I've had a lot of dreams, but, if the, you know, you can tell the difference if they're from God or if they're not from God. And sometimes God has to sanctify your dreams. How many know that? But God's wanting to reveal things to you. And as I said, uh, I believe I heard a list of preacher the other night was preaching on it. And he says that the old men shall dream dreams. The young men shall see visions. How many ever seen a vision? You ever see a vision? I've seen things that seem like a vision. I know I was praying one time and and I was seeking the Lord, and, and it was after, I guess it was after midnight. It was late. I looked at the corner of the room, and there was a light there. And that light came down, and it came towards me. And that light hit me right there. And it went all through me. And it was so, so strong and so powerful, it felt like that my bones in my body was shaking and trembling because of the presence of God. I guess the Lord does things like that to confirm to you and to, and to, to help you to realize that God's alive and well. He's not dead. He's alive. Praise God. And that's why God's wanting to speak to, as I said, the young men is going to see visions and the old men. Of course, I was young when I had that. Man, the old men shall dream dreams. And I would like to have a dream from God, wouldn't you, that will inspire us and stir us up and saying, God, I want more, more of your anointing, more of you, God, because there's so much that needs to be done. Man, there's so much that needs to be done in our, in our cities here that we live in. It's so much that needs to be done. People out there, they're, they're just living, amen, uh, after the same as the, their, there's really no, there's a God, but they just don't know he's right there for them. Some people believe in those God, but they don't, they don't serve him. They don't live for him. Of course, we were all in that boat one day. We were all in sin. We were all our conversations with in the world and after the things of the world. But when Jesus come, that tempter's power was broken, and Jesus set us free. 
And he gave us a hope of a better life and a better world to live in. Hallelujah. I know you look at the world today and see all the problems that's happening. You know, the Lord's got to give us grace to help us do all this. His grace is sufficient for us. Amen. But see, when God sent that wind, God wasn't in it. You can almost see it in the spirit. Amen. Elijah was in this cave and he stood outside the, the door of the cave and he looked and he seen a storm, a, a great wind storm come by and it just knocked everything down in its way. Like sometimes we see storms that knocks everything out of its way. Like a, a tornado would take everything that was in its, in its path away and destroy. But God wasn't in that. He wasn't in the earthquake either. But God was in the still, small voice talking to him. See, he wasn't, he wasn't done with Elijah. Elijah had more to do, and God told him, amen, to do certain things. And he went on, you know, and Elijah, he thought, I'm the only one. Look at all, the, all those, I'm the only one left. And the Lord said, no, he said, there's 7,000 there's 7, that hadn't bowed their knee down to, amen. They had, there's 7,000 7, people that are serving the Lord. 7,000 people that hadn't bowed their knee to Baal in, in the world. They, they wouldn't kiss the feet of the, the, of the idol and so forth. But God... He said, I'm the only one. And God said, no, you're not. Sometimes you feel that way. I'm the only one. Nobody else cares. Nobody else will uh, reach out and do anything. I'm all by myself. And the Lord said, no, I got people that's working. I got people that's doing things. How many know that? If we can just do a little bit for God, well, what a blessing that would be. Just a, even just a, maybe a witness to tell somebody about the saving grace of God. You don't know what God's going to do. You don't know how God's going to get a hold of somebody. You might save someone that's been demon possessed, amen, and bound by the devil and maybe bound by the cares of the world. And, and you just, uh, you, you want to, amen, testify to them. And you can, you maybe not see very much happening to you. Have you ever testified to somebody and they just looked at you? But then when they get by themselves, God could talk to them with that still small voice. He can talk to them and tell them, amen, that there's a better way. You can take up a cross and follow Jesus. And I know sometimes people don't want to take up a cross and follow the Lord, but he said, take your cross up. Every one of us that's saved, washed in the blood of the Lamb, we have a cross to carry. And I tell you, it gets heavy sometimes, but God comes along and lifts it up with his mighty hand and gives you grace to help you through it. Give him a clap, all friend. God is God, and he always will be God. All right. And he said it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Why are you doing what are you doing here? He knew he run from Jezebel. He knew that. What are you afraid of? Why are you so afraid of this woman? God's more bigger than any person or any problem that they are in the world today. How many know that God's hand is in short? He's able to reach down, amen, and save and deliver and set the captive free. Oh, yes, he is. But what do you, you know, what if God would ever ask you that question? What are you doing here? Well, you, you know, you should be back there preaching. You should be back there working. And now you're miles and miles and miles away from where you're supposed to be. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. Now, he was probably telling them the truth there. The children of Israel did forsake the covenant of the Lord. 
they turned and they went in their own ways in their own direction. And he said, he thrown down the altars and slain the prophets with the sword, and I, even I alone, am left, and they that seek my life is to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the, wil to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint, he, he mentioned a, a king, Hazel, and to be king over Syria and Judah, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou an anoint to be king over Israel and Elijah, the son of Shaphat, and Abel, those names are really hard sometimes to pronounce. Abel, me, ho, la. That's a person. That's a person. <laughs> Amen. So, anyway, he said, and thou shalt anoint to, to be a prophet in the room. And it's talking about, I believe it was talking about Eli, Elisha was going to be anointed. You're going to anoint a prophet. One place, if you read it, it says, you're going to be taken up. He didn't want him to die because he was going to take him to heaven in a whirlwind. He didn't want him to die. He wanted, he, Elijah wanted to die, but God didn't want him to die because he was going to be a witness in the last days. In the tribulation period, he's going to be a witness to the children of Israel. See, he never died. Enoch never died. These two men never had died, and they're going to be, they're still in the presence of God. Can you imagine Enoch being, what, 1,000, 6,000 years old, and Elijah several thousand years old? He's still, even, he's still in heaven. He's still there with God. And he's going to be coming back one day to preach in the tribulation period. No, a lot of people don't believe that, but that's what the Bible tells. And I just accept what the Bible says anyway. Man, I said, I just believe what the word says. And so he went on his journey. He anointed Elisha. And then he says he anointed him. He took the, the mantle that he was wearing. He took it and throw it over Elijah, or Elisha rather. And something happened supernaturally, changed him. Because right then, you know, he was working in the field with 12 yokes of oxen, and all at once he decided just to leave everything and follow Elijah. It's like Jesus said, if any man will follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Glory, hallelujah, I shall not be moved Anchored in Jehovah, I shall not be moved Just like a tree planted by the waters I shall not be moved In his love abiding, I shall not confiding I shall not be moved just like a tree planted by the waters I shall not be moved I shall not be I shall not be moved I shall not be I shall not be moved just like a tree planted by the waters I shall not be
shall not be moved.